is connective and it's a, you know, the general introduction material is connective, it's almost as large as that of epithelial. And the main reason here is they're so broad of a class of tissues, it was like there's almost when we were classifying tissues in the family from Sedefin left we call it connective tissue. But there are some commonalities to the family. So before we talk about how broad the tissues are that are in this family, you can look at some general functions and then general characteristics of connective tissue. Uh, the reason it was originally named when we produced most of the recycles are the that process goes on, which we discussed. And finally, uh, there's more different and more mass of connective tissue in our body than other tissues. Uh, one co constant characteristic is that the cells of connective tissues are dispersed in a matrix, and the matrix is a huge term that is a catch-all for many different things, but one way of making that clear is the cells aren't hooked together like epithelial cells. We talked about desmosomes, we talked about uh, Deren's junctions. These are connective systems that hook cells together. Uh, that doesn't occur in connective tissue. Connective tissue cells are dispersed in a matrix. And so that's definitely a commonality or something that's distinct from uh, the other forms of tissues. And the matrix is a catch-all term, and even worse, we refer to it as ground substance plus uh, fibers. The ground substance is a multitude of varying substances, and it, it can be solid as in bone, it can be semi-solid as in elastic cartilage, or it can be fluid as in blood. So these are the, the stuff that the cells sit in, so it varies the cells are dispersed either in a fluid like blood is or in a solid matrix like bone is. But what's consistent is all of them are surrounded by, quote, some matrix. And there's protein fibers affiliated with it we'll describe as we go through it. It'll become more clear as we discuss it. Another commonality of connective tissue is there isn't a free surface. In other words, epithelia have a lumen or compartment um, area, if you will, on one side, the apical side, and then they hook to a basement membrane on the other side. Skin, of course, has the environment on one side and then the basement membrane on the other. So uh, connective tissue always has uh, other tissues on each side, so there's no free exposed surface. Uh, unlike epithelium that doesn't have blood vessels going through it, uh, connective tissue is highly vascularized. And, there's always large and small blood vessels going to connective tissue, so that's another commonality. So what we usually do is start out with the different types of cells that are dispersed in connective tissue, because we said it was cells dispersed in the matrix. So this is the major cell types of connective tissue. And the first are called fibroblasts because they produce the fibers that are part of the matrix. So these cells function in life is to produce the different fiber systems that we're going to talk about, and this is supposed to represent a fibroblast. You notice the arrow going to that cell is called a fibroblast. That's a kind of a, I think some authors use a lot of liberality when they write their books, and this particular author invented the name fibrocytes so it could be the same as melanocytes and, and other cells, but if you look at literature from years, we've called the cells that make fibers, fibroblasts. So uh, sometimes I will be using names that are different from other texts, but I'm quite sure since I've been in this field so many years that you'll, this, this term, if you learn it, will be far more valuable than learning a term that only one author ever uses. And you'll, I spent some time saying that because you're going to see it off and on. But fibroblast is a synonym for this author's fibrocyte, which is unusual. Uh, macrophages are cells that engulf uh, particulates, uh, foreign objects is another way of saying it. But what, what uh, is common of all macrophages is they have the capacity for phagocytosis, which now you've probably been introduced to in other classes, but the membranes of these cells can envelop uh, toxic substances, fragments of other cells, uh, 
aged cells and all kinds of other materials. So they're adapted to engulf things that we want to get rid of. Uh, use very broad uh, descriptives. Um, there are different families of phagocytes in every, um, or phag macrophages in every uh, organism and, 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 and every different tissue. And I'll talk about them and, and their role in different tissues. But as a general term, we usually call them macrophages, and that's how they're referred to in, in connective tissue. The next cells are called plasma, plasma cells in almost every text. He, for some reason, calls them plasmacytes. But these family of cells are a family of lymphocytes. We call them beta lymphocytes, and they produce antibodies. And it's useful to have them in the connective tissue because if, for example, um, the skin gets damaged or we get a cut in our skin and uh, an infection starts there, uh, the immune, immune function would begin with plasmacytes releasing antibodies to block further progress of that in, immune problem. So anyway, uh, connective tissue often has many plasmacytes that are have evolved to produce these antibodies. Uh, mast cells are another unique cell that produces a product. The pr product produced by mast cells is part of the inflammation family and it exists to help us fight invasion of, of, of microorganisms and so forth. Uh, one of those products is histamine and histamine, uh, if you have allergic disorders such as asthma, uh, you're quite familiar with, uh, is one of the uh, chemicals we always release in an immune uh, event or during inflammation and it causes such things as bronchial constriction and dilation of blood vessels, both of which we need to fight off uh, infections. Heparin is an anticoagulant that's often used to, in uh, inflammation episodes. So anyway, these mast cells are found also in tissue, uh, in connected tissue. And finally, the matrix in, in most uh, tissues, as we say, uh, is a combination of ground substance and fibers. And uh, one of the most common ground substances in the simpler of connected tissues is GAG, which stands for glycosaminoglycans. But it's very long chain polysaccharides that consume space, if you will. They're difficult to fold, so it's like a spring that's gone off and, and spread out. And so they hold this... Uh, connected tissue out in a, a spread out array, glycosamines, and glycosamine and glycans, GAGs. And it uh, depends on, again, which tissue you're talking about, but that's the most primitive type of ground substance. It almost creates a fluid around the cells. And then the fibers can be of many different types, uh, but it's useful to understand the three basic types. Collagens are represented by this uh, these rope-like arrays, and I think of collagen, I guess I'll get into it in a little bit more detail in a second, but as being the reinforcement bar, or rebar within concrete, they're the high tensile strength uh, fiber that gives uh, tensile strength or resists stretch in connected tissue, where the elastic fiber has the opposite effect, and the blue lines represent elastic fiber, just like the term this gives stretch or elasticity to connective tissue. And finally, this is one of the few good pictures I've seen of reticular fibers. Reticular fibers are also made of the same protein as collagen. Collagen has lots of different forms. But this, this family of collagen is in the skin, almost thread like and has a lot of interconnections. So these form nets. That's the operative term. They form nets or and act to filter out substances, and you'll find reticular fibers in high concentration in the spleen and other areas where we do a lot of filtering. And I'll get back to all these terms as we go through the different connective tissue families. So the first family are, and so now we're going to go through the different classes of connective tissue. And the most simple and most, uh, you know, uh, general, I guess you could say, type of connective tissue is called loose or areolar connective tissue. 
and it consists of those cell types that we've been talking about, mast cells and fibrocytes and so forth, and all of the fibers, but it's, it's a quite disorganized tissue as you go through the others. These are found surrounding blood vessels and surrounding nerves. We often call them fascia, and they provide kind of structure or hold things together. Uh, they have, like I said, all the fiber and cell types we referred to in the other families. And they give elasticity to the blood vessels and support the, the muscles underneath them. So anyway, it's called loose or areolar connective tissue. The next level is a lot different, and that's called dense regular connective tissue. And this is made up of, it looks like almost ropes. It's a long strand, very organized strands of collagen fibers. And so lots and lots of parallel arrayed collagen fibers. And this is what I was looking for. This is a figure of the structure of collagen. Again, there are all different types of forms and arrays in collagen. But what most collagen has in common is it's a, it's a protein made up of a series of amino acids. And the Y and X in most cases could vary, but in most cases it's pro, proline and hydroxyproline. Well, what's common in all cases is the smallest amino acid which is glycine, is in the center of this strand that allows the strand to form a very, very tight uh, spiral, if you will. And then we wrap three of these to make it even tighter, and so you end up essentially with, with a rope, a rope composed of three strands of protein. And then these often uh, coalesce into many of these parallel collagen fibers and form essentially this very long rope-like array. Whenever I see this, I'm reminded, and I don't know if you've ever, uh, excuse me, I usually do it off because I was trying to get the person to fix the mic. Anyway, um, the, uh, I don't know if you've ever visited the uh, bridges in San Francisco, but they have a, pick, as you go across the bridge, they have a, a setup that shows how the bridge was constructed, and they show the cross-section of the cables of the bridge. And the cables are essentially made of wires, but the wires are wrapped and wrapped and wrapped until you have hundreds of wires, and then they're wrapped further in more wires and so forth. And that's what collagen is, a little protein you could just pull apart with a, you know, the tiniest of a, a tweezers. But if you put so many of these together, it's just like a thread being woven into a rope. You can end up with a very, uh, a rope of very high tensile strength. And this is what our tendons are and our ligaments. Tendons are uh, ropes that connect, if you will, muscles to bones. Ligaments are a connective system between muscles. And we're going to talk about tendons and ligaments when we get into anatomy a little bit. But what they have in common is a lot of tensile strength. It's tough to tear your tendon, but some of us do that. Uh, we also take the same collagen material and put it in every different direction. It's sort of like fiber, where you have fibers going in all different directions. And the purpose of that is so you can have a lateral tensile strength. In other words, what tendons do is a longitudinal tensile strength. It's hard to pull the rope, uh, have the rope give when you pull on it. This is almost like a wall. And so they put this collagen fiber, we, <laughs> they, when we created our body, we put this collagen in all different directions, and that creates a very kind of a wall-like affair of the collagen. And it's found underneath the skin in what we call the dermis area to give our, our skin uh, strength. Also, we call capsules that surround organs, uh, which the membrane around organs, we call it capsule. And there's a very dense one around the heart called the pericardium, and there's one around the kidney. And these capsules, protect the kind of very much um, more fragile tissue beneath them. So anyway, it's a protective wall, if you will, of connective tissue. Then for another purpose, we'll have some of the connective tissue that's quite elastic. And the difference is instead of collagen fibers, and this figure isn't too great, but there will be a lot of elastic type of fiber in that. And elastic tissue consists of essentially a protein, but the, it's little peptide strips, and then they're coupled together by cross-links, often disulfide cross-links, and they allow a uh, stretch or increase in length of the tissue. 
And uh, these are not so much high tensile strength, but elasticity. And these are found in the walls of arteries, so it can change volume. They're found in the bronchi and the trachea, so in areas where the, the walls have to be stretched. Makes sense. I mentioned reticular tissue, and I was talking about the different type of, of connect or fibers. And these are, again, these fibers are made up of collagen, but instead of being woven into large, thick bands, these are individual collagen filaments that have lots of cross-linking, and they form nets. And so these delicate collagen fibers prevent, uh, it's like a sieve that prevents things from going through it. So you can see kind of in here, it's harder to see in some microscopic vision, but you can see if you focus here that there's a network of fibers in there. Uh, one of the most logical places in the lymph nodes that filter the blood and, and try and separate from the lymph and the blood the particles that get into our system and then phagocytize it. So anyway, they're found in places, the spleen and so forth, where we want to filter the material. And I'll mention where they're located, like in the kidney, as part of the filtration system when we get them. Very distinctive family of connective tissue. If you uh, this coming week, if you have lab, we can look at slides of all these things. And once you look at an adipose slide, you never forget what it looks like. It's extremely distinctive. It looks like the slide on the left, this is an artist's depiction. But it looks like you're looking at a lot of bubbles under the microscope. And that's where they are. The, the cell wall is pushed on the outside and the nucleus on one side. And it's like a bag of triglycerides. And, in higher organisms, we store our energy not as starch, but as triglycerides. And so these cells are specialized to store this very high energy material so we can use it when we need it. And it, it's located in very specific places in our body. It's located right before, below the, the, the skin. We call it hypodermis. It's located around the kidney and around the heart, pararenal and pericardiac. So we'll talk about that and some of the significance of that when we do different organ systems. Cartilage is another family of connective tissues with also a very distinct purpose and structure, and there are different types of cartilage. Uh, so some of the commonalities of cartilage is the cells that make up cartilage are called chondrocytes, and that simply means cartilage cells. And they're in little spaces in the cartilage called lacuna. I, I used to know what that meant from the Spanish term. I can't remember. Maybe somebody knows. Uh, but anyway, it's something like space. But anyway, the, that's the little holes in the cartilage that the chondrocytes live in. And the matrix that surrounds them is, is semi-solid. And it varies from almost gel-like to almost bone-like. So depending on the type of cartilage, as you'll see, it varies in its tensile strength. And the material, the basic material is called chondroitin sulfate, a protein that uh, has uh, more stability than just uh, uh, the GAG that we're talking about in, in uh, the polysaccharide that's in uh, uh, loose connective tissue and so forth. Lots of collagen fibers again, and then there's a membrane that surrounds collagen called perichondrium, which is just simply a connective tissue membrane. This is the first type of cartilage that we'll talk about. It's quite flexible, and what gives it its flexibility is it has this uh, chondroitin sulfate matrix and fine collagen fibers rather than a dense array of collagen fibers. And some of the places it's found are bone our articulations, which we're going to get to also to in a couple of weeks, are the connective places where bones articulate or bend past each other, like your elbow and your knee. The surfaces that rub past each other are coated with this cartilage, this hyaline cartilage, and it's extremely smooth. If you have seen a large bone that's been butchered, is, is uh, left or you give it to your dog or something, if you find the articular surface, it feels uh, smoother than glass. It's extremely smooth, and that's coated with this hyaline material that prevents uh, friction. Trachea has lots of cartilage in it to keep it open, and that's hyaline cartilage. And the ribs, uh, called costal cartilage, some of the ribs are 
compose a good part of them of cartilage, and we'll talk about those ribs and where the cartilage is located when we get to. Uh, the next level of cartilage has a lot more collagen in it, so it's called fibrocartilage. It's almost it looks a lot like the dense regular connective tissue that makes up our ligaments, but instead they're surrounded by uh, chondroitin sulfate. So this is a very uh, dense almost pad. You've seen the pads that they put under some uh, furniture, so the furniture is held up but supported strongly. This is what fibrocartilage is, and it's present in between our vertebrae. That's the famous disc that we have problems with as we age and tremendous amount of pain induced. Uh, pubic symphysis between the two os coxal bones of your uh, skeleton, and we'll talk about that and where this is located. And we have some special devices in our joints called meniscus that gives us protection from these bones bouncing together. These, are, these structures are all made of this very specific fibrocartilage. And finally, it seems like we have tissues to meet every need, uh, there is a form of cartilage that dense with elastic tissue, and it does exactly what you would suppose, although it has some resistance, unlike elastic connective tissue, and being that it's surrounded by chondroitin sulfate, it has flexibility that the other type of cartilages don't have, and you can easily see its characteristic. It's what your outer ear is composed of, what we call the auricle. Your voice box, your larynx has elastic cartilage within it. The canal going into your ear also has elastic cartilage, so it's quite flexible material. Uh, these are found in textbooks all over, but it's a nice summary of the different types of cartilage, where they're located, and some of the interesting characteristics. Okay, and we're still not completely traveled through all the connective tissue. Another one is bone, and we're going to talk about bone in uh, as an introduction to the skeletal system that we're going to get to in uh, just a, a week or so. So we'll go back through this, but it's interesting when we're doing uh, connective tissue to at least talk about the basic characteristics of bone. I said the cells of cartilage are called chondrocytes. The cells of bone are called osteocytes, which makes sense. And like chondrocytes, they also exist in little holes called lacuna. So the the osteocyte, and I'll show you a better figure in a minute, but they sit in little holes here called lacuna, and they're surrounded by concentric layers of the matrix you see right here. So it looks like a tree that you cut in cross-section. We lay down our bones in concentric layers, and the whole system, one, one of these series of cycles is called a Haversian canal system, and the canal, canal in the middle is called the Haversian canal. So anyway, we'll go through all the parts of it in more detail later, but bone has a very distinct uh, structure as you look at it under the microscope. Uh, the layers, each of these layers of a Haversian system are called lamella, which is the term which we commonly use for layered structures. And there are some little uh, canals that go between the different osteocytes called caniculi that radiate between the, the osteocytes. And we're going to talk about those and their function. I think it's better just to save that to when we get to that lecture on bone. The matrix, what's being laid down in these cycles is a salt kind of material. It's called calcium hydroxyapatite. It's a calcium phosphate uh, material is quite almost uh, like a rock in its structure, calcium phosphate, but it's a specific calcium phosphate product, so we call it calcium hydroxy appetite. And there's lots of collagen fibers, and here we go again. We put those into all types of connective tissue to give uh, that tensile strength quality. Uh, there's two general types of bone in humans, uh, compact and spongy. And on the outside of bone, all of this on the surface of a long bone, that's compact bone, and it's just made up of those traversing canal systems in very tight array. Here's a, they've shown this picture in, in magnification. So this is uh, compact bone that's coated all the way along the surface of the long bone. 
But inside that, there's some, we call them trabeculi, some little, uh, I don't know what you have, processes, I guess you could call them, of bone. And it looks almost like some sort of a, a plant growth. But that is called spongy bone. So all of this area in here, lots of spaces, and it's called spongy bone. And the marrow cavity also is lined with spongy bone. It's within the little evacuated spaces of spongy bone that marrow is which can be fat or also erythropoietic or blood producing material and we'll talk about that in the bone lectures also. And finally uh, blood just introduce the subject here and we'll have much discussion on it second semester but just it's nice to introduce these subjects in generality because we mention them off and on if you have some idea where we're going it helps. Uh, highly specialized fluid, but it is in the family called connective tissue, and it makes sense. It's individual cells that are surrounded by a matrix, and the matrix in this case is called plasma, and these cells that are dispersed in there, and this is kind of a confusing term the first time you hear it, are not called cells, but formed elements as a family. So the particulate part of blood is called formed elements. Some of the formed elements are cells and some aren't, as you'll see. So erythrocytes over here on the left are these uh, biconcave discs that carry hemoglobin. We'll talk about that are responsible for oxygen transport. Then there are leukocytes of varying families represented here in the middle that have all kinds of responsibilities, mostly in terms of the immune system, but also in other kicking off uh, other processes in our body. And finally, platelets, and that's why we call them formed elements. Platelets are fragments of cells. They're not classic cells. They're little pieces of what we call megakaryocytes, but they're, they're bags of chemicals that are released during mostly blood coagulation. So those are the principal formed elements, red cells, white blood cells, large family, and platelets. Um, and we'll talk about them and their roles in far more detail uh, second semester. And finally, plasma. And we're going to also talk about all the you know, components of plasma in far more detail when we get to that. And finally, the third form of um, connect of, uh, tissues. We've talked about epithelium. We just were talking about connective tissue. And the third class of tissues are muscle. And we have several lectures this semester coming up on structure and uh, function of muscle in great detail. But right now, I just want to introduce muscle as a tissue and talk about the different classes. So what characterizes all muscle is it has the ability to contract or shorten. The muscle can change its, its uh, dimension based on the molecular constituency and, and control systems. And it has lots of, of uh, functions. We usually think of muscle as movement of our skeletal system, that skeletal muscle, so it allows us to move ourselves around the, our environment and also move our environment by using our arms and so forth. That's supposed to be peristalsis. That should be an L there instead of a T. Peristalsis is the movement of material through our intestinal tract primarily by waves of contraction down the uh, what we call the alimentary canal, so that's peristalsis, and that's another function of contractile tissue. Regulation, we have sphincters, I think, sphincter boy. We have sphincters uh, in much our digestive system and our urinary system and so forth that control the passage of material through lumens, and so that's a matter of regulation. And finally, pressure. Uh, the uh, Pressure in our respiratory system and in our cardiovascular system is controlled by muscle activity and very intimately and exactly, and we'll discuss that later on. Okay, so the skeletal uh, muscle is the first family of muscle we'll talk about, and it's characterized by the cells being striated. So this is a cross-section of a, of a skeletal muscle cell, and it has these horizontal lines. These lines that go across the narrow part. Uh, I think I should first say that skeletal muscles are very long and thread-like. The cells extend all the way from tendon to tendon, so they're not little tiny cells. The cells are like threads that go great distances from one tendon to another. Think about your 
your biceps, for example. So they're long cells. They're composed of, of they're almost fiber-like, and there's many in parallel, like almost like the collagen fibers and tendons. And if you look at it under the microscope, they have these little cross striations, and that's due to the register of the filaments, the myo or contractile filaments within them. We'll talk about it in more detail later. And their nuclei are on the outside of them. They're pushed along. They're right here under this, the sarcolemma, the membrane that surrounds muscle cells. And there's many of them per cell because the cells are so very long. Uh, the type of contraction that skeletal muscle does we call voluntary. In other words, we decide to move something and we use our conscious nervous system to facilitate that. So we call it voluntary activity. And uh, their function to move the skeleton about our environment different ways. Heart muscle, which we call cardiac muscle, is only found in the heart. That's the only place it's located. That's useful that the name is the same thing. And the cells are a lot different than skeletal muscle cells. They're short, they're not long. They have little branches and they interconnect at specific sites. So this is the end of one and you can't see the other end, but here's another one. So anyway, they're short little branch cells. Um, they're striated and they have a single nuclei. So like skeletal muscle cells, the myofilaments within them form very specific arrays. So they have the same striations but they only have a single nuclei. They're interconnected by something called uh, intercalated disc, which is essentially a, a conglomeration of gap junctions. And we introduced in the last lecture what a gap junction is, but that's that point of cytoplasmic continuity that a specialized connective system between cells. So there's many, many points of, of uh, cytoplasmic continuity in these cells, but note, and I'll make a big deal of this later, these are organized in a certain geometric uh, organization pattern. In other words, there's not gap junctions between the cells in parallel, but there are gap junctions at longitudinal ways, which forces what we call electrical continuity down one direction. So the gap junctions are side of continuity, so one cell can excite its neighbor, and we'll talk a lot about that later on. Uh, the um, muscle contractile activity of cardiac muscle is not under our control, we call it involuntary, and a uh, new term, but we call this a functional sensation, fancy word for the fact that all of these cells work as a fan. So when you activate one cell, it activates its neighbor that activates its neighbor that activates its neighbor. So we call it a functional sensation, the cells all work together. That's not true of skeletal muscle. Each cell in a skeletal muscle assemblage is innervated. There's a, there's a, we'll call it a muscle neuron or motor neuron going to every individual skeletal muscle cell. So we can turn on the cells individually. And we'll talk about this in detail shortly. But that's not the case in the heart. One cell ignites the next, it ignites its next. There's not a myoneural junction on every cell for sure. And so we say it works together as a sensation. The cells work together as a family. Um, this, these terms involuntary and voluntary are not exactly defined. And so, you know, when you say we can regulate our heart, we can't regulate our heart voluntarily. It's, lo it's largely because we don't train ourselves to do this. Just as a sideline, I had a, a friend that used to demonstrate polygraphs and he could demonstrate, uh, you know, these monitors on your heart and that measure blood pressure and heart rate and so forth that we use in labs. And he would come to a lab and demonstrate this thing. And he said, now you see my heart rate go up and it go up. Now you see my heart rate go down. And he, he had demonstrated these things for so many years that he could literally voluntarily control his heart rate, which isn't a difficult thing to do, it turns out, if you have something, if you're coupled to a monitor and learn how to do it. But anyway, generally we cannot do that. Most of us can't say, now my heart rate will increase. Just in the funny aside. Okay, smooth muscle is the third class of muscle tissue. Uh, it's uh, called smooth for, and turns out, obvious thing, and that is it's not striated. If you look at the cells, there's no striations involved. They look just smooth. What's interesting is they're very small cells and they're fusiform. 
A fusiform structure is like a tube that's pinched at each end, so it's uh, aerodynamic, if you will. But if you look at these cells, they're exactly what they look like. They, they're kind of skinny little cells that are pinched at each end, and they uh, are arrayed in very thick arrays, smooth muscle. And it's involuntary for the most part. We can't control its activity. And it's found in the gastrointestinal tract. So the stomach and the intestine have layers of these smooth muscle cells, bladders, uh, arteries, which we can control pressure by, arterioles, um, the uterus. So most of, of our viscera that has significant amount of muscle is smooth muscle. And when we get to that area, we'll talk about how we control that activity and the molecular mechanism of smooth muscle activity. Again, a nice simple diagram that puts, the, or a table that puts these ideas into kind of a simple format. The last class of, of tissues, and I'm not going to say much about it, not that it's not complex or has lots of, of uh, categories and so forth, is nervous tissue. We'll talk about it in far more detail later on. In fact, the whole last half of this semester is on nervous tissue. Uh, one couple easy things to discuss are the difference between central and peripheral nervous tissue. The central nervous system exists within what we call the dorsal cavity and is two large structures, the brain and the spinal cord. So when you hear CNS or central nervous system, they're talking about the function of the brain and spinal cord, where the peripheral nervous system are nerves emanating from the central that spread out to the rest of the system. So the cranial nerves and, and the spinal nerves and all the nerves that come from uh, sensory devices and so forth, everything that's not part of that brain and spinal cord structure. Uh, the principal functional cell in the nervous system are neurons. And even at this early stage of the class, we like to tell you the principal components of a neuron. They, there's many different families of neurons, so this is a very, very general description, but they consist as a family of one central part that surrounds the nucleus, and the term perikaryon literally means karyocyte is a cell with a, nerve, with a nucleus, so this means it's the part of the cell around the nucleus. That's literally what that means. So this right here is the perikaryon. Some people have simplified it and call it the cell body, but it's a central part of a neuron. And there are processes that come out from that perikaryon. One large process that conducts nervous activity or what we call action potentials away from the cell body is the axon. So usually, but not always, there's one large axon emanating from the cell body, which is pictured here, and then many other smaller processes, which we call dendrites. So the dendrites contain the receptive surface, if you will. So that's where other cells synapse or uh, activate a given uh, neuron, and then uh, if that neuron responds, it'll send its signal out to an axon. It's a very simplistic description. We'll talk about it in a lot more detail. So I said the dendrites are the receptive surface, but the cell body itself actually often has synapses right on its structure. Just because the neurons aren't, are the central cell in the process, there are many other functional cells in the nervous system. And it turns out there are far more uh, neuroglia, way, way more neuroglia than there are neurons. And we used to think they were just a supportive family of cells. But as we learn more about the system, it's amazing how many things that these cells are responsible for. And we're going to go through each of these cells and their function when we get to the nervous system. But just uh, here's a very broad description. So there's ependymal cells that uh, cover the and participate in the formation of uh, cervical spinal fluid, but they cover a lot of the column the spaces or the uh, uh, places within. Uh, I'm trying to make it simple, the the brain where the cerebral spinal fluid is is formed. Uh, there are microglia that do macrophagic, macrophagic type activities, um, astrocytes, unique and very complex cells, Schwann cells are not even listed. So there's a large family, and we'll talk about their function in detail when we get to the nervous system. 
And finally, I think this is the last slide that I have on this lecture. Means and time is just kind of a general catch-all expression for some connective tissue that is present during embryonic development that gradually uh, differentiates into other types of tissue. So during uh, our embryonic period, all of our connective tissue is uh, very uh, loosely organized into what we call a mesochyme. And then that gradually, uh, the cells become more defined and the connective tissue becomes more defined and uh, becomes the very distinct families of connective tissue that we described um, in previously. Just so you know what that term means. Okay, so let me do our little attempt at the eye clicker system. So if you want to get out your transponders and turn them on, See if it actually works this time. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. I already messed it up. Okay, so let me put the first question up if you're ready. I guess I can't put that there either. Let me try it over here. Okay, the first question. Which of the following proteins have a strong affinity to divalent cations? And anything that binds to divalent cations is called a chelator. This is a calcium chelator. Uh, which of the following also functions as an intracellular linking molecule that links between cells? I increased this to uh, 45 seconds. Some of these questions are a little bit hard. Looked like you uh, didn't need the extra time. Okay, you did pretty well on that one. Let me look at the result. Oops, oops, okay. I don't know why that did that. There we go. Okay, so see what the result was. <laughs> good, good, good. So that would be just a, an IV question. You keeping up while you knew that it was cadirin, so that's very good. So, so far, so good. Uh, second question. Which of the following molecules would be expected to exhibit similar translocation kinetics with either an artificial phos bi phospholipid bilayer or a plasma membrane? So a phospholipid bilayer is just to that uh, backbone of a membrane and compared to a membrane itself. So this is my classic question. Can you take the information I gave you and integrate it and figure something out? So let's see how you do on this. See how you did. Looks like it wasn't quite as good as the last question. Kind of, kind of dis dispersed. Okay, so this would have to be something that simply diffuses through the bilayer. In other words, if it went through a protein or anything else, either a pore or a channel or anything, it would not go through it the same by the same rate and mechanism as the bilayer itself. And the only thing that would do that is a gas, CO2. So C was correct. Uh, chloride has channels. Galactose has a carrier. Sodium, all types of carriers. Amino acids have carriers. So only uh, CO2 would do that. I got a call last night. Here's a funny story. I got a call last night from a physiologist at one of our medical schools in the state. And he said that he had a review of his first test with his first year medical class yesterday, and one of them came up in the review and said to him, I hate your questions, I hate your answers, and I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, I need to understand that. And he said, secondly, your students never bitch. 
He says, you kill them so much during your class that they never complain. They're having fun. So anyway, um, this kind of painful thing becomes useful later on, just trying to make you happy. There's a couple others here I know you'll like. Okay, the next one. Low cytosolic calcium calcium concentrations maintained in most cells by membrane protein that exchanges sodium and calcium. We talked about that. What would be the classification of this transporter? your progress, but also to show you some philosophy about answering questions. A lot of times when there's something like the last three on a question here, you'll find a true answer in the midst and not read all of them. And so you'll go for the first one, which is what that was under, secondary active. It is secondary active transports. But it's also coupled. It's coupled as two, a molecule coupled simultaneously to, to two molecules of an antiporter. Uh, so a, C, and D are all true. Well, is it passive? Okay. My wife just screams at me about this question. She says, it's not passive, but the pump itself is passive. There's no ATP couple to it. She disagrees totally, but I will stand by this. But anyway, I wouldn't put it on a test because she'd get mad at me. But E, I think, is by far the best answer. Okay, number four. Just a memorization thing. What's the mediastin? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I was trying to hit start. There we go. when you have the question like the one before and like the coming up one, uh, which I love. So anyway, uh, you can memorize things and you definitely need to. What I'm getting to my point here is uh, if you don't memorize the facts, you're dead because there's about 40 or 50 percent or 60, 70 percent. Most of the questions actually are just like this. They're facts. You have to get those because I keep throwing the ones like the coming one I in. So Anyway, this is just to make you aware that there's a lot of factual questions on my test that you do need to be able to know, but then you have a few like the coming ones. So one more today. Okay, see if you can figure this out. I'll go ahead and start it. Everybody ready? No.
Okay. Let's see what she chose. So it's well it's well distributed, uh, uh, and there's a remarkable number of people have figured it out. But let me see if I can explain it here. Um, at equilibrium, if you have two closed compartments, the chambers won't equalize in osmolality, and you definitely know this is true because an osmotic pressure is being measured. In other words, uh, equilibrium cannot occur. The water can't keep going over here because this is a solid compartment. It's not like a balloon. Even a balloon, you wouldn't have it. And so you're going to always have more water in A than B because osmotic pressure will be, well, well, actually it's called stopping pressure, I could use the way, will block further osmosis. And so, at, and the water concentration of B is greater than A, that will never occur. Uh, the water concentration will not be equal because again, you can't, you, you're having an osmotic pressure basis. And it turns out you probably haven't ever heard the term stopping pressure, but it's just like it says, that's the pressure that counterbot countermands osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure is formed because water is diffusing for A to B. If you stop that, if you have this pressure that stops, which will occur at, at equilibrium, that stops osmosis, that's called the stopping pressure. It's how much pressure will stop osmosis, and that will occur at equilibrium. So D is the correct answer. And why do I have those lines there? Does anybody in mathematics know what those lines are? Absolute, Absolute, Absolute value. We got some rocket scientists here. Uh, osmotic pressure is one direction and uh, stopping pressure is the other. So the absolute um, number and definitely there's osmotic pressure as anyway. Okay, see you next time.